فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد we were speaking about the event of al fil hadith al ifk hadith al fil sorry we were talking about the event of the elephant and i spoke in our previous uh, lesson that abraha got upset and he got angry uh, regarding what the bedouin man did and he made an oath that he's going to go to the kaaba and that he's going to destroy it abraha prepared an army that was large in number and he took with him some narrations mention that he took with him nine elephants and other narrations they mention 13 elephants and he chose for himself abraha he chose for himself a elephant rather from the greatest and the biggest akbar al fil the biggest elephant that he could find and he called the elephant mahmud he named the elephant mahmud the arabs they heard of this now they heard of abraha coming they heard of the, an army that he's bringing forward the elephants that he has and you have to understand in the arabian peninsula uh, they don't know elephants elephants is not from the animals you guys know famous hadith of imam malik rahimahullah when an elephant came to the city of medina somebody brought it and all of the students of imam malik rahimahullah ran so they can go see it and uh, hisham ibn ammar he was from the students of imam malik he didn't move he sat around and everybody else went and then he said to him why, why are you not going to see the elephant and he said my parents and i haven't come here because his father sold his garden so he can come and seek knowledge he said i didn't come to see elephants i didn't leave my hometown and my house so i can see elephants i came to seek knowledge and imam malik was amazed with him and how sharp he was so the elephant is not an animal that is known in the arabian peninsula it's not a common animal rather it's not seen some people in the arab world have never seen an elephant only through technology and computer tvs now so Abraha is bringing an elephant. He's bringing 13 based on one narration, another narration, nine. And he himself, Abraha, is on one of the elephants. He calls this elephant Mahmoud. The Arabs, they hear about it. And so when they hear about it, they want to now respond or even defend the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the doings of this individual, Abraha. So a man from the Ashraf al-Arab, from one of the leaders of the Arab of Yemen, specifically Yemen, whose name was known as Dhu Nafarin. He was known as Yuqalu Lahu Dhu Nafarin. His name was called Dhu Nafar. He called his people. He's from the Ashraf and the leaders of the people of Yemen. He called his people, he called the leaders of Yemen, and he said to them, and anyone else from the Arabs who he believed that would listen to him, he said, let's fight against this man, Abraha, and his corruption that he's trying to bring to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's fight against him. So they went out to fight with Abraha because Abraha's army was large in number and he had elephants. They didn't have those right now tanks and, you know, the elephants are very strong animals and it's bigger than a horse and a camel. So Abraha destroyed Dhu Nafar and his followers. And Dhu Nafar was brought to Abraha as a captive. So when he was brought to him as a captive, Abraha wanted to kill him. And Dhu Nafar said to him, Ayyuh al-Malik, O king, لا تقتلني, don't kill me. فإنه عسى أن يكون بقائي معك خيرا لك من قتلي. It, is, it might be better for you, for me to remain with you than trying to kill me. It might be better that you let me be with you than killing me. So then Abraha uh, imprisoned him and did not kill him. Then Abraha carried on 
to go towards the Kaaba. When he came to a Ard, a land known as Khath'am, which was specifically by a very famous tribe, a Qabila known as Qabila to Khath'ama. This tribe, this is their land. When Abraha reached there, and the tribe of Khath'am, they consist of two big tribes. The first one of them is Shehran, and the other one is Nahis. Those are the two tribes of Khath'am. So Abraha now came to the land of these, the tribe. He's got Dhu Nafar with him as a captive, and he's working towards going to the Kaaba. So then the people of Khath'am, specifically the leader and a man who was in charge of the tribe, whose name was known as Nufayl ibn Habib al khathamiyu What he did was, he spoke to the tribe. And he said, listen, are we going to today watch? Are we going to watch the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be destroyed? This is something we shouldn't tolerate. Come, let's destroy this man. So Nufayl ibn Habib al khathami and the tribe, the two part, Khath'am was two, as I said to you, two, two big tribes were under Khath'am. The first one was Shehran, and the second tribe was Nahis. Okay? And the reason I'm mentioning these tribes, they are very important in the Sirah, brothers. Don't dismiss tribes. Each tribe, you're going to learn what role they played in Islam later. Are you with me, brothers? Very, very important learning the Ansab al Arab. And the lineages and the tribes that were there. Because our, it revolves around our religion. Are you with me, brothers? So, Abraha, now when he came to this place, Nufayl ibn Habib, he prepared the army and they fought with Abraha. When they fought with him, with him again, Abraha being strong and powerful, he killed those who he can kill. And Nufayl ibn Habib al Khath'ami was brought to him. When he was brought to Abraha, Abraha wanted to strike his neck and kill him. He said to him, Ayyuha al-Malik, O king, لا تقتلني, do not kill me, فإني دليلك. I am now, from this minute onwards, the one who is going to show you the path. <coughs> the Ard al-Arab, the lands of the Arabs, is a map I have in my head. I will show you each land that you want to take, in whatever direction you want to go. Not only that, وَهَاتَانِ يَدَيَّ لَكَ عَلَى قَبِيلَتَيْ خَثْعَمْ I also have with me the two wings of the tribes of Khath'am. I have Shahran with me and I have the tribe of Nahis. They are bisam'i wa ta'ah. They are here to listen to you and they are here to obey you. So then Abraha then said, leave him. Khallu sabilahu. Let this man be. Don't kill him. And so he took him with him. Nufayl took, sorry, Abraha took Nufayl ibn Habib al-Khath'ami with him. So he said, come with me. Until they came to Ta'if. Until they came to Ta'if. Ta'if is what? Close to <coughs> Mecca. They came to Ta'if. Mas'ud ibn Mut'ibin al thaqafiyu And he was a rijal in Thaqif. He was from a man from the people of Thaqif. They came to him, because he's in Ta'if, they came to him. And when they came to him, they said to him, we're here, we're heading towards the Kaaba, and we're willing to destroy the Kaaba. He said to Abraha in response, Ayyuha al-Malik, O king, innama nahnu abiduk, we are your slaves, sami'una laka, we will listen to you, muti'una, we are also going to obey you, laysa indana laka khilafun, we have no khilaf with you, we have nothing against you, wa laysa baynana, and rather there is not between us and that house that you're going to, which is the Kaaba, ayya alaqa. There's no relationship between us and the Kaaba. The Kaaba has nothing to do with us. It's nothing to do with us. Inama turidu al bayt al bi Mecca. The house that you want is Mecca, right? We, the people of Ta'if, we have our own house. We have our own uh, idol that we worship. We don't worship Allah to al Uzza. And the people of Ta'if didn't. So if you want to go, you can go. And now what I want you to brothers pay attention here is, is that there's a fa'idah and lafta and latifah that you can take from here. And that is what? You can see from this. What can you see brothers? Brothers, what can you see? That the tribes are not all united. Each tribe has their own what? Idol that they worship. Later, inshallah, as we're going to see, Abraha is going to be what? Destroyed by Allah, right? What is everybody going to see? 
the power of the Kaaba. صح? Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala preparing the stage for the Prophet. So all the tribes come together. They realize their idols are nothing. And they got destroyed in days. Ta'if, your, your ta'if was destroyed. Your land was destroyed. Like in Mecca, birds came to support it. Are you with me? So all of them now realize the importance of the Kaaba. So when the Prophet ﷺ comes out and he calls them, they all see the seriousness of the Kaaba. And that's something we're going to see later. Are we all together? This is important. So what happens is, he, they say to him, you can do what you want with the Kaaba. This is what Mas'ud ibn Mut'ib ibn al-Taqafi says to him. And what they did was the people of Ta'if, they sent with him, they sent with uh, Abu Abraha, a man whose name was Abu Rigal. They said, this Abu Rigal, he will show you the path to Mecca. They will, he will take you through Ta'if quickly, back roads of Ta'if, and he's the one who's going to make you reach <coughs> Mecca. Abu Rigal went with Abraha. Abraha's got people now to show him the path, how to get to Mecca. Until he came to a place known as Al Mughammas. Mughammas is a place, Mawdi', which is Qareeb, very close to Mecca. And it's the path from Mecca to Ta'if. If you look at the book, Kitab Mu'jam al Buldan, it's a, it's a Belda, which is Mawdi' al Qurbu Mecca, very close to Mecca. And it's actually the route through Mecca to Ta'if until today. At this particular point, Abraha commanded. His followers, he commanded his followers, a group of his army to go to Mecca. And he said, rob whatever you can. Before we go into destroying Mecca, and we do what we have to do, go and rob the people's belongings. And he sent a man from the people of Habasha whose name was Al-Aswad ibn Maqsud, with a horse, and a man, and he said, follow, go with him, and bring us what you can. We will stay here, bring us any food and whatever we can eat. They, they went, and they came to Mecca. When they came to Mecca, Mecca was the trading of the land. The, all the businesses and everything is here. So they robbed the belongings of the people of Mecca, and they took the wealth of Quraysh, and other than Quraysh, and they took with themselves 200 camels owned by Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib now 200 of his camels are in the, the, the things that Abraha is taking. Who owns this? Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim, who is the Prophet Sallallahu what? Grandfather. Abdul Muttalib that day is Quraysh's eyes. And Quraysh is. He's Quraysh's most respected individual. Quraysh really became upset now. This is our leader. This is our most respected man. How could somebody dare to take his belongings? How can somebody even take our trade? Plus, you have to realize Quraysh was the only tribe whose belongings were never robbed. All the other tribes used to rob each other's belongings. Quraysh's belongings, belongings were never taken. They were seen as the custodians of the Kaaba. They were respected. For the first time, not somebody has the audacity to go to the, the custodians of the Kaaba and take their belongings. Quraysh became angry. The tribe of Kinana became angry. The tribe of Hudayl became angry. All of them were said, this is something we have to speak about now. This is something we can't tolerate. Abdul Muttalib was very smart and he's close, they realized they knew that they had no ability to fight with Abraha. So what did they do? They left trying to fight with him. Abdul Muttalib said, fighting with Abraha right now is close to impossible. The army and the strength that he has is something we cannot tolerate. Abraha, he sent to Mecca a man by the name of Hunata al Himyari. He sent a man by the name of Hunata al himyari He sent him to Mecca. This is after the belongings were, was brought back to Abraha. He had his food, he slaughtered camels, they ate, they enjoyed them ta their time. Before he came into Mecca, he sent a messenger. His name is Hunata al himyari He said, Hunata, 
go to Mecca and convey this message on my behalf. Say to them, who is, he said to him, Sil an Sayyidi Ahli Hadal Balad. Ask who is the master of these people, who is their leader, who is their tri tribal leader, who is the person they look up to, who is that? And their honorable one. And then tell them, once you meet him, say to him, the king Abraha, he has not come to fight with you guys. Say to them that he has said to you, I have not come to wage war with you all. I have only come just to destroy this house. This house will no longer stand. That's all I'm here for. If you guys don't stand in my way, if you don't stand in my way, except for, if you guys leave me alone and don't wage war against me, I will give you safety and I will not fight with you. But if you guys stand in my way and you become an obstacle to me, then destroying this Kaaba, then he said, فَلَا حَجَّةَ لِي فِي دِمَائِكُمْ I have no need to fight you. I don't want to spill your blood. But if you guys want to get in my way before I reach the Kaaba and destroy it, then I will fight with you. فَإِنْ هُوَ لَمْ يُرِدْ حَرْبِي فَأْتِنِي بِهِ And he also said, if the man who you speak to, whoever he may be, Abraham is saying this, he says to you, I don't want to fight, and I'm not interested in fighting. If that's what he says to you, then tell him I want to meet him. So Hunat al Himyari went, he conveyed the message to Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib said, okay. Abdul Muttalib said to him, Wallahi, by Allah, we don't want to fight with this man. We don't even have the ability to fight him. This is the house of Allah. And it is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Khalil. I won't translate what the word Khalil is. There's no word in English for it. وَبَيْتُ خَلِيلِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ And this is the house of who? Ibrahim, Khalilullah. This is his house as well. فَإِنْ يَمْنَعْهُ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ بَيْتُهُ وَحَرَمَهُ Allah is the one who owns it and he's the one who's going to prevent whoever he wishes from it. That's what he said. Hunata then said to him, okay, if that's the case, then Abraha said, is... If you don't want to fight, come to me. فَانْطَلِقْ مَعِي إِلَيْهِ So he took Abdul Muttalib by the hand and, and he said, come with me. Abdul Muttalib said, I'm not going to go by myself. I'm going to go with some of my children and some of my men. So Abdul Muttalib, he went on his riding beast. He took a group of warriors and fighters and he made his way with him. When he came to the army, Abdul Muttalib requested and he asked about who? Dhu Nafar. He said, where's Dhu Nafar? Who is Dhu Nafar? Huh? Who is Dhu Nafar? Ha! Min Ashraf Qabilat al-Arab. He said, Dhu Nafar, where is he? They said, he's arrested, he's not dead, he's alive, here he is. He's a captive here, he's arrested. He said, I want to speak to Dhu Nafar, Abdul Muttalib said. Abdul Muttalib spoke to Dhu Nafar. He said to Dhu Nafar, how is your situation like? Dhu Nafar said, وَمَا غَنَاءُ رَجُلٍ أَسِيرٍ بِيَدَيْ مَلِكٍ يَنْتَظِرْ أَنْ يَقْتُلُهُ وَدُوًا وَعَشِيًا What would my situation be? A man who is a captive who is imprisoned, who all he's waiting in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening to be killed. I'm waiting for my time basically. It's a matter of days before he would kill me. Abdul Muttalib then said, is there anything you know you can help us with? Something you can tell us? He said, Naam. I know the man who is, because this is from, he's from Yemen. He's the one who would know Abraha in his situation, right? He said, I only know the leader, the one who is the sa'iq, huh? the driver of one of the horses, uh, one of the uh, elephants. He's my friend. His name is Unais. I know him very well. I will send on to him a message. And I will request from him to honor you, to respect you. And I will tell him that you are Abdul Muttalib, Sayyid Quraysh. You are the leader of the people of Quraysh. And you are Sahib Iri Makkah. 
the caravan of Mecca, and you're the owner of it. Abdul Muttalib, he used to feed the people of Mecca. He used to feed them and he also used to feed the birds. Abdul Muttalib, that was his characteristics. He used to what? He used to take crumbles and he would feed the birds. He even used to go to the tops of mountains. Abdul Muttalib would go there, Ru'usil Jibal, and he would put there crumbles and food for the birds and the animals so they can eat. He's a seed of his people. But look how they respect him. Look how he was for them. I will say this to him and I will remind him of who you are and your value, Abdul Muttalib. Unais said, I will take him to Abraha and I will make sure Abraha knows who he's dealing with. So Unais took Abdul Muttalib. When the message reached Unais, he was told about who he is. Unais grabbed Abdul Muttalib by the hand and he brought him into Abraha. Abdul Muttalib and Abraha for the first time are going to meet. Abdul Muttalib was a man who was very tall. Very tall. And he was very, very, very handsome. And as I said to you before, he was an individual who was very, very respected. If you saw Abdul Muttalib, you will venerate him, you will you respect him. Nothing else in your heart towards him except, except respect. The minute you lay eyes on him. This is who he was. When Abraha saw Abdul Muttalib come in, he couldn't hold himself except to respect him. So when he saw him, عظمه, he honored him. You know when the Prophet Sallallahu he wanted to call out who he is. <coughs> what did the Prophet say? I am who? In one of the battles, what did the Prophet Sallallahu say? And Ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am from the children of Abdul Muttalib. He didn't say his father, nor his any or anybody else, except who? Our messenger said this. And Ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib was a man who was respected, was different, was unique amongst the people. Abraha saw Abdul Muttalib. He was gobsmacked when he saw him. Respectful man, honored him. And this is the conversation that took place between the two of them. Abdul Muttalib, when he came in and Abraha saw him, Abraha was sitting on his throne. He was sitting on his throne. Because this is what they were, this, they were carrying his throne for him. When he saw Abdul Muttalib, he felt the want to place Abdul Muttalib right next to him. But this would be a disrespect as a leader to bring somebody onto your throne. You can't do that. Nor did Abraha want Abdul Muttalib to sit somewhere low. Because the respect that he had for him when he saw him. So what did he do? Abdul Abraha got off his throne and he found a middle ground for both of them to sit together. And he sat shoulder to shoulder with, with him. And Abraha straight away said to Abdul Muttalib, Qul hajataka, tell me what you want. And you have to understand Abraha is a uh, mutarjim, a translator. So he said, tell him, what does he want? Abdul Muttalib said, my want is, number one, I want him to give me back my 200 camels that he's got. They took it from me. When he said that, Abraha said to the translator, say to him, When I saw you, you fascinated me, the way you walked, the way you talked, the way you sat down, who you were, the way you carried yourself. And I became very hostile when I saw you. I felt slow. Abraham saying this. But when you spoke and you asked me for your 200 camels, you became very low in my eyes. Why? Are you going to speak to me about 200 camels that I took from you? And you're going to dismiss the whole mission I've come for? You're going to dismiss the fact that I'm going to come and I'm going to destroy your house and I'm going to destroy the house of your forefathers. <coughs> Mecca will not have no house. It won't exist. The Kaaba won't exist anymore. This is my purpose. This is why I have come. Abdul Muttalib then said, 
Inni ana rabbul ibil. He said, I am the rabb of, of these camels. These 200 camels, I am the rabb. Meaning, I am the owner of it. Wa inna lil bayti rabban. And the house, the Kaaba, it has its own lord that owns it. Sayamna'uhu, he's going to prevent it there. And stop whoever tries to transgress to his house. I'm speaking about Imran. This one I know he's got his owner. One who's going to take care of it. Abraha then said, This Rabb, he won't have the ability to stop me. Abdul Muttalib then said, This is between you and him. That's between you and the Lord of the Kaab. But I don't want my 200. I want my 200 camels. Abraha then said, and he commanded for Amara Abraha to yuradda ibli ibli Abdul Muttalib. He said, give him back his 100 camels. 200, sorry, camels. As soon as Abdul Muttalib was given the 200 camels, he done one of it. فَلَمَّا قَبَضَ قَبَضَهَا قَلَّدَهَا As soon as it was given to him, he done what is known as تَقْلِيدُ الْبُدْنِ تَقْلِيدُ الْبُدْنِ is they place on its neck a symbol which is basically to tell it that this is a hadyu, a hadyu for the house of Allah. Once they do that, no one is able to touch it. Yeah, it's owned by, uh, that's it, khalas. It's a sign, it's a wasm, it's a alama. No one's allowed to touch it. Sahih. And he directed it towards what? Abdul Muttalib, straight away, he didn't make his own, he didn't make his own possession. He, he gave it straight to the Ka'bah. Ka Ka and he said, this is owned by the Ka'bah. Abdul Muttalib stood up and he left. As soon as Abdul Muttalib came back to Mecca, he said to his people, because now he saw the army, he saw the number of people that he has, Abdul Muttalib said one thing to him. He said to him, to, the, to his people, leave and run to the valleys. Don't stay in Mecca. Don't stay around the Kaaba. The tribes and everyone, leave, leave, leave. Everyone go to the valleys and outside the outskirts and as far as you can from Mecca. Stay away from Stay away from the, Don't go to the high mountains and everything. Don't go to those places. And why? Because Abdul Muttalib believed, he felt that the army's harm will cause the people a lot of problems. The army was too much. And they're going to do something to the people. And he realized that no one is able to what? To push them back or even fight with them. Abraha got ready, prepared his army, he got everybody ready, he put everything together, he prepared them fully, launched everything, and he said, let's now go to the Kaaba. <coughs> when he reached the valley of Muhassir, Wadi, Wadi Muhassir. Ma, Wadi Muhassir is a place between Muzdalifa and Mina. Is a place what? Muzdalifa and what? Mina. Barak al -filu. The feel the elephants, it went on its fours. I sat down. I'm going to ask you guys questions later, inshallah ta'ala. Where did it stop? The names and everything is going to be questions, inshallah. This place, Muhassir, which is between Muzdalifa and Mina, the elephants, they sat. They won't move. So they tried to move the elephants. So whenever the feel was towards Mecca, they directed it towards Mecca. It would what? It would, it would move. Now, so the, the, sorry, the, the, the elephant was stood up and it was told to go forward. It wouldn't go. It was told to go the opposite direction. It wouldn't move. It was told to go to the two opposite direction. It wouldn't move. Some of the riwayat that Bayhaqi mentioned, Nufail ibn Habib al thaqafi you know who he was? al khathami sorry. Huh? He spoke to one of the, they say one of the fields, one of the elephants, he spoke to it in the ear. And he said, Uburuk Mahmud. Mahmud, go on your force. Go on your force. فَإِنَّكَ فِي بَلَدِ اللَّهِ الْحَرَامِ You're in the sacred land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he let go of the ear of the horse, uh, sorry, elephant. 
the elephant sat on his foes. That's one narration that's mentioned. Then they started to hit the elephant, whip it as strong and as powerful as they could. It wouldn't move to any directions. They got confused. What's up? Who could move an elephant? These are the elephants, they've prepared to use it against the Kaaba. But the elephants are the most biggest things. What can push an elephant that they have to push with? As they were like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent tayran birds, ababil. What does the word ababil mean? Ababil means jama'at in groups. Yatba'u ba'duha ba'dan. Groups come, they do their thing, they go. Another group come, they do it. Another group come and they... All of them came from the direction of the sea. They all came from the direction of the sea. Each bird had with it thalatat ahjar, three stones. The size of these stones were not too big. They were like the adas. Very small stones. Stones that are like the hummus. Chick, chickpeas. It's very small, nothing big. One, it was carrying it on its peak. Huh? And the other with two hands, or legs. And it was directed towards each person. So the birds, they let go of the rocks, or the stones that were... <coughs> when the stones fall on the person, straight away their limbs rip into pieces. It burns the person. And it rips them apart. Then they ran to the path which they came from. And they were asking Nufayl ibn Habib al-Khat'ami. They asked him, what path can we take to Yemen? Okay, where's the road to Yemen? They wanted to run to Yemen. Nufayl said to them, when he saw what was taking place, the famous statement, he said, Aina al-Mafarru wa ilahu al-Talibu. Where can you run to? When the one who is trying to grab you and get, seize you is the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today, Abraha is being overpowered. He's not the one who is, the one who is one. He's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threw stones at them. And they fell. Each person, as they were standing, they were falling, dropping, dropping. Abraha, on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted him with an illness. This illness... It got to his body and his body started to cut into pieces, limbs. His fingers were cut, his legs, finger part, his body parts, especially his fingers, they all went. And he wasn't even able to reach Sana'a, where he came from. They said he did some of the narrations, but when he did, he reached there like a burnt bird. The way his body became and everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلِ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِنْ سِجِّيلِ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took away the tyrant individual, Abraha, from the Kaaba. Allah defended his house. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the army of Abraha and that which took place took place in the eyes of the Arabs, Quraysh became respectful. They became a very respectful, respected tribe. And they started to believe whom Ahlullah, that Quraysh are the people of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fought for the people of Quraysh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended them from the enemies that wanted to destroy them. Also, what grew in the eyes of the Arabs was the Kaaba and the honor of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they started to realize what this place is about, Mecca, and the value that it holds. And many poetries and respect and came out. People started to read poetries and lines of poetry speaking about what took place. This event was in the month of Muharram. This event, the uh, the hadith of, uh, of the field, it was on the month of Muharram. And this was before the birth of who? Nabiullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many 
how long between it was? 50 or 55 days. Prophet ﷺ, 50 or 55 days after the Prophet was born alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was trying to introduce the Prophet's coming to the people and bring it to their attention that something great is going to happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was also trying to purify the Kaaba from these idols. And he was trying to bring back honor to the Arabs. You have to realize they had no value at this time. Because they now realize there is a Lord who controls everything. They're trying to be, they're being bonded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was which year? The year the Prophet sallallahu was born. Alayhi salatu salam. As you all know, Abraha has now died. The Kaaba has now been brought back to Quraysh. And Abdul Muttalib was a man who's respected his community. But as I said to you before, Abdul Muttalib has endured from Quraysh after when he dug the Bir, Zamzam, the Zamzam whale, he, we, he realized he's weak, that he's not strong, he hasn't got strength. He needs support from Allah, he needs something to help him. Not Allah, but he needs support. So he made, and the only child that he had was who? Al Harith. So he made a nether, he made an oath and a covenant. That if Allah gives him subhanahu wa ta'ala nine boys in total, Harith is already there, nine extra to make it ten. If Allah gives it to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that these boys reach an age where they're strong, that he's going to slaughter one of them in honor of what Allah has done for him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created what he created. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave him ten boys and six girls. Ten boys that he wanted, he got them. He got Al-Harith, who was the oldest of them all. And the mother of Harith was Safiya bin Tu Jundubin. That was her, father. That was her uh, mother. His mother, sorry. Harith's mother was Safiya bin Tu Jundubin. He also had Az Zubair. And his mother was Fatima bin Amr ibn Aidin al Makhzumiyah. Abu Lahab. Abdul Uzza. His mother was Amina binti Hajar. She was the Prophet's uncle. Al Muqawwam. And his mother is Hala. Number five, Dirar, who is the same mom as Al Abbas. His mother is who? Natla. Was the mother of Dirar Al Abbas. Abu Talib. His mother is Fatima bint Amr ibn Aidin al Makhzumiyah. So Zubair, Abu Talib, and the Prophet's father. All three of them had the same mom, the same dad. The seventh is Jahlun or Hajlun, both ways I said. His mother is Hala bint Wuhaybin. <coughs> Eight, Abdullah, who is the Prophet's father. And his mother is who? It's the same mother of Abu Talib and Zubair. Number nine, Hamza. His mother is Hala bint Wuhayb. And last but not least, Al-Abbas. His mother, his mother is Natla. And Abbas was the youngest. Abbas was the youngest. And the statement of Ishaq in his seerah, where he said that the Prophet's father was the youngest, is incorrect. Ibn Ishaq is wrong to say that the Prophet's father's father was the youngest. The Prophet's father wasn't the youngest. Who was the youngest? Al Abbas was the youngest, the Prophet's uncle. And who was, uh, who was so it's the Pro Abdullah and then Hamza and then Al Abbas. So the father of the Prophet was the third youngest. Um, when Abdul Muttalib, his children became 10, and he realized that they had number. And these are the ten boys that he has. And of course he has six girls. His six daughters are Safiya, who is the Prophet's auntie. Umm Hakim. And she's the one who's known as Bayda and Bayda, Atika, Umayma, 
and Arwa and Barra. Those six are the Prophet's aunties. Naam. When the children became, the sons became ten, Abdul Muttalib made an oath to Allah Taala that if his sons are ten, what is he going to do? He's going to slaughter one of them. And now he realized they, re they reached a number, the ten number that he wanted, he promised, they reached it. So he stood up to fulfill the promise that he made. And this is something that the Arabs were well known for, al wafa'u bil ahd, to fulfill the promises that they made. So he said to his people, especially his sons, he brought them all together, he said, I made this covenant way before you guys were born. Here I am today with the kids, sons I wanted. So what shall I do? His sons, they said to him, Dad, fulfill the promise that you made. Do what you promised. How should we do it then? He said. They said to him, Dad, each person takes, you take a, what do you call it? So you take a uh, lot, write everybody's name in it, and then you basically pick the name of the person. So he did it. Every single time whose name came out? Or whose name came out? The Prophet Sallallahu father. Abdullah came out. And what you need to realize is the Prophet's father, Abdullah, is a habbu waladi Abdul Muttalib. The child that he loved the most. Abdul Muttalib, this is the son he loves the most. And that's what he said when it came to Abdullah. Abdul Muttalib said, La in suri fa an Abdullah fa ana bi If only this was diverted from Abdullah, I would have been in good. If only this didn't happen to Abdullah. Somebody else other than Abdullah, if it was to happen for. Every time it's coming out, it's him, it's him, it's him. So Ab Abdul Muttalib said, What shall I do now? I have to fulfill the covenant that I made. So they commanded him, they said to him, if you're not going to let go of the covenant that you've made, and you, because Abdul Muttalib didn't want to let go of the promise, and you know this is the most beloved child to you, the best way to reconcile this and the best way to get this done is, go to a fortune teller. This woman, she's, she knows what to do. She'll be your best plan. And it was a, a woman they used to respect. So they went to her, and when this, this story was explained to her and everything was told to her, she said, how much is the dia? The dia here means blood money. How much is the blood money of a, a boy for, for amongst you guys? They said, asharatu min al-ibil. So if a boy, if a man dies, it's 10. She said, okay. Take 10 camels. Take camel, ten, ten, put the 10 camels here. Pick, do the lot again. If it comes out for Abdullah, add 10 camels onto it. Do it again. Every time the lot comes for Abdullah, carry on adding camels onto it. So it reached 100 camels. And once it reached 100 camels, then it went onto the camels. The lot hit the camels. It moved away from Abdullah. She said, now whatever number of camels that you have, you need to slaughter those camels for God's sake. You fulfilled your covenant. Does it make sense? So Abdullah did it. Uh, so Abdul Muttalib did it. He did it. A hundred camels. It came out for the Prophet's father, Abdullah. The hundredth time, when the camels reached a hundred, it, it hit the camels. He said, he, he said, okay, let me do it again. He did it three times. Every time the camels reach a hundred, and then after, after it reaches a hundred, the uh, camel, it comes to the camels. So she, then he realized that this is what Allah wants from him. That's what he said. So what did he do? He slaughtered a hundred camels. That's not little money. This is what fulfills your promise. <coughs> and he did that. Um, the Adhan is going to go off now. We're going to uh, pray, inshallah ta'ala, at 7.30. Yeah? <laughs> There's this narration that many people mention. There's a narration that many people mention. And Imam, Ahmed, uh, sorry, Imam Hakim narrated this in his Mustadrak. That the Prophet Sallallahu said, Anabnu, I am the son of Al-Dabihataini. I'm Anabnu Al-Dabihaini. I am the son of the two slaughtered. Referring to who? Referring to my father Abdullah 
and Ismail. This narration, a Hakim narrated in his Mustadrak. Hakim, of course, when he brings a hadith in his Mustadrak, he means that it's the condition of Bukhari and Muslim. That's why Al Imam Al Dhahabi, what he did was he done ta'qibat on that book. Basically, he worked on that book. And what he did was he said, Isnaduhu wahin. This hadith, this chain is very weak. And Imam Al Qurtubi also said the same. He says, hadith la sanaduhu la This hadith is weak, there's no proof in it. Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, he said, Wahada hadithun gharibun jidda. Al Imam Al Suyuti in his fatwa, he said, Wahada hadithun gharibun wa fi isnaduhu man la yu'raf. And Sheikh Nasir rahimahullah ta'ala in his tafsir, a hadith da'ifa, he says, La asla lahu. So this is not correct. But yes, in terms of concept, it's true. The Prophet didn't say that. But it's true, the Prophet came from who? Ismail. And also who? Abdullahi. Now we're going to go into Abdullahi and his upbringing. Abdullahi is the Prophet's what? Father. Abdullahi reached the age of 25. The Prophet's father, he reached 25. And he was a boy, young youth, kind of shabban. A young youth who was very handsome and very good looking. And he was an individual who was highly respected in the community. Of course, his father being Abdul Muttalib, he kept up and he lived by the name of his father. So Abdullah, he desired and he wanted a, to marry. This is 25, he wants to get married. So they saw the best woman for him was Amina binti Wahbin. Amina bint Wahbin, she was a woman who was from the people of what? Amina bint Wahbin, Ibn Abdul Manaf, Ibn Zuhrah, Ibn Kilab, Ibn Murrah. And that day, the women who were in Mecca, Amina bint Wahbin was the best of them. The Prophet's mother. She was the best woman in terms of personal dignity as an individual and in terms of her lineage and her tribe and who she, she was from. Her father was a, the leader of the people of Zuhrah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father, Abdullah, he was the father, son of who? Abdul Muttalib, who we spoke about. There was nobody better for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come from. A mother like this and a father like this, who were very chaste. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother was a woman who was very afif. She didn't have relationships and this, she had none of that. Nor did Abdullah, he wasn't known to have that. He was a very good man. So, Ibn Ishaq, he says, فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَوْسَطَ قَوْمِهِ نَسَبًا He was the best of people in terms of his lineage because of the fact that he came from who? Amina. And he came from who? Abdullah. وَأَعْضَمُهُمْ شَرَفًا مِنْ قِبَلِ أَبِيهُ وَأُمِّهِ there's this story that many people narrate, like in la but I'm going to mention it, inshallah ta'ala. A lot of people who I've, saw, I've seen who mention the history, they mention this story. This story is gharib. Ibn Ishaq mentions in his seerah that a woman, she presented herself to Abdullah, the Prophet's father. She came and she presented herself, meaning she wanted zina, haram from him. And Abdullah, the reason why she came for him is that she saw from him Nur. He was a shining man. She saw Haiba, that which Ab Abdul Muttalib used to have. So she done zina with him. When she did zina with him, Abdullah, she said he lost the Nur that he had. So when Abdullah came to do zina with her again, she said, La hajata li bika. I have no desire for you. I don't want to do zina with you. She said, I went by you the first time I saw you and there was this light that attracted me to you. And then I saw you the second time after we did zina and the light had gone from you. This riwayah is a story that people mention. In terms of its sanad, it's munkar, evil. And in terms of its chain, it's also weak. Ala kulli hal, Abdullah, the Prophet's father, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, he went to Sham. The Prophet's father, he went to, after marrying Amina bint Wahbin, at the age of 25, as all the people of Quraysh would do so, he went to where? He went to Sham. 
with a caravan owned by the people of Quraysh. This caravan, it carried the merchants of Mecca. It's all the belonging of the people of Mecca is in there. So Abdullah, he went with them. And when they went, they went by the city of Medina. And Abdullah, that day, he became very, very, very sick, very ill. And he couldn't pursue the journey with them to Sham. So he said to them, Ana atakhallafu inda. Inda akh- I'm going to I'm going to stay with my my maternal uncles. He's referring to the people of Bani Adi ibn Najjar. These are his what? These are we remember when we spoke about Abdul Muttalib, what did we say? Where was Abdul Muttalib born, born in? Medina. Sahih? And the, the, the mother of Abdul Muttalib was who? A woman of the people of? Adi Najjar. Adi ibn Najjar. He said, I'm going to stay with them. And he stayed with them sick for one month. So he's, sorry, this is after they came from Sham, sorry. Not the, he went Sham with them. This was after they came from Sham, their way back to Mecca. Abdullah, he stayed in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ's granddad was still alive. Abdul Muttalib was alive. So Abdul Muttalib, when they came to Mecca, he said to them, where's Abdullah? They said to him, they said to him that your son Abdullah, he has chosen to stay with his maternal uncles, with the people of Adi, Adi ibn Najjar, and that he's sick. Abdul Muttalib, when he heard that, Abdullah to him was precious. This is one of his most beloved children. So he, saw, so he told his oldest son, Harith, he said, go, take a horse and get to the bottom of the situation of Abdullah and tell us how he is. So Harith took a riding beast as fast as he could and he came to the city of, city of Medina. And when he came to the city of Medina, he had found out that his brother Abdullah died and that his brother was buried in Medina. And he was buried in Fidar in Nabigha, in the building of the people of Adi ibn Najjar, the Adar that they used to have of al Nabigha. And he was a man from the people of Adi ibn Najjar. Harith, as soon as he found the news, he made his way back to uh, Mecca and he told his father Abdullah about Abdul Muttalib about the death of Abdullah and that he died. And this issue got very, it got Abdul Muttalib very saddened and very hurt by hearing of the death of his most beloved uh, son. Inshallah Ta'ala will conclude there. I will speak about in our next Saturday class, we will speak about the Prophet's birth and how he grew up as an orphan. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaitan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.